Hey class, it's time to introduce the next book that we're going to be reading, Le Mort de Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory. This is really kind of a classic work of medieval literature and deals with the stories of King Arthur, which are certainly one of the most enduring uh, group of stories to come out of the medieval era. There are so many works that we could look at from the medieval era that would be really cool and fun to read, but I think this is certainly one of the most culturally significant ones. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about the author of Le Mort d'Arthur, Sir Thomas Mallory, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the book and what makes it a particularly important book in the realm of literature and lit literary history. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the genre and style of the book um, and what's kind of unique about it in the medieval era. Um, and uh, where Arthurian legend comes from and all that sort of stuff. When you get done watching this lecture, there's also going to be a documentary um, to watch that um, talks a little bit about who Arthur may have been historically as well as the development of the stories of Arthur over time, which is perhaps even more important than who Arthur might have been historically as a person. So let's get started talking about uh, the author, Sir Thomas Mallory. So Sir Thomas Mallory is an interesting figure. One scholar has referred to him as a mysterious author for a mysterious tale. Um, the stories of Arthur have a certain mystery and intrigue about them. Um, there's magic and revenge plots and all that sort of thing. And it's kind of fitting that we don't know a whole lot about Sir Thomas Mallory and who he may have been. Um, so he is a bit of a mystery to us as well. Most likely, he was a knight because the title Sir has almost always been attached to his name with the publication of the book, and Sir was usually a title reserved in the medieval time period for people who were knights. Um, however, his exact identity is unknown. Um, there have been scholars who have proposed a number of different people as possible candidates for who this Sir Thomas Mallory was. The most popular uh, idea is that he was Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel. Um, that's perhaps one of the oldest arguments um, and uh, has gained the most support over the years. There have been several people who have written uh, pretty thorough uh, and convincing papers on why Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel is the correct author of the text. However, there have been several other scholars who have proposed other potential Thomas Mallory's as this Sir Thomas Mallory, and they all lived around the same time period, so they are all legitimate possibilities. Uh, they all could have been um, the person who wrote Le Mort d'Arthur. Um, and among these are the Welsh poet Thomas Maylor, which when you anglicize it and put it from Welsh into English, Maylor becomes Mallory. Um, Sir Thomas Mallory of Papworth and Sir Thomas Mallory of Hutton Conyers. Um, and all of these are respectable arguments as well, right? Um, there have been uh, scholars who have done good research and have produced arguments for this. In the long run, I'm not sure how much it matters. The fact is that Sir Thomas Mallory wrote this book that has had a huge impact on uh, the development of literature and culture after it. Um, so I'm not sure it really matters who it was, but it is kind of interesting to speculate. Whoever Sir Thomas Mallory was, he was likely in trouble with the law in some way, shape, or form. Uh, this seems pretty clear of what we know about the author, Sir Thomas Mallory. Now, if it was Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel, there's actually some pretty significant evidence that he may have been kind of a thug or a criminal. One particular scholar has written a quite detailed account of Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel's life and the crimes that he was accused of committing. Some people have had a hard time with that, though, because the character of Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel seems pretty inconsistent 
with the character of the author and the values that are supported in Le Morte d'Artur. The code of chivalry is highly honored in Le Morte d'Artur. Um, there's a strong sense of morality and really kind of a condemnation of many of the behaviors that Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel is accused of having uh, exercised um, and uh, act the ways in which he's acted. And so that's led a lot of people to really question. I think that's why a lot of other scholars have suggested other Sir Thomas Mallory's because um, the values of the book do not seem consistent with the values of Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revel's life. Um, regardless of that, whoever the Sir Thomas Mallory was, he was most likely a political prisoner at the end of his life. Whoever Sir Thomas Mallory was, he lived through the War of the Roses in England. This was a war, it was really a civil war, in which the House of Lancaster and the House of York, which were two branches of the same really large extended family, were both laying claim to the throne of England. And there was a civil war that erupted over who was going to be the next king. And pretty much all the knights fought in that war on one side or the other. And it actually wasn't uncommon for knights to switch back and forth between sides, depending on who seemed to be winning at the moment. So Sir Thomas Mallory most likely fought in the war and most likely fought for both sides at some point. Um, and he probably ended up as a political prisoner because of this. One of the sides probably imprisoned him simply to keep him from fighting on the other side. Now, he spent many years in jail, in prison, but that would not look the same as we would think of it because the code of chivalry dictated that you treat your fellow knights with uh, respect and uh, that you really care for them and uh, treat them as an equal. And so if Sir Thomas Mallory was imprisoned, he was probably basically on some form of kind of house arrest in somebody else's palace or castle. Um, and so he probably had a decent bedroom with a fireplace and access to the castle's library, which is probably what he used for writing his work. So most scholars agree that Sir Thomas Mallory actually wrote Le Morte d'Artur while he was in prison. And since he had access to the library and access to things to read and write with, and he was well taken care of, it was actually a great chance for him to do something creative and work on writing what has become his masterpiece. Um, and so he really probably used a lot of his time while he was kind of on house arrest to do this. The book wasn't published until after his death and he actually most likely died imprisoned. Um, it was later published by William Caxton. William Caxton was the first person to bring the printing press to England. He did not invent the printing press. Uh, Johann Gutenberg invented the European version of the printing press, although an earlier version of it had been invented by the Chinese. Um, but William Caxton was the first person to bring a printing press to England and to begin printing books. And one of the early books that he printed and produced was Le Morte d'Artur by Sir Thomas Mallory. Caxton was also responsible for that title, and he was tying into an older French tradition of Arthur legends, and he wanted to make a specific connection with the French tradition. Though there are some scholars who think that Sir Thomas Mallory may have had another title for his book, um, but William Caxton called it Le Mort d'Artur, which when you translate it to England, to English is The Death of Arthur, and that makes a very catchy, kind of grabby sort of title, uh, The Death of Arthur, um, seems kind of very dramatic. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of the history of Sir Thomas Mallory and where the book came from. Now let's look a little bit in particular about this book and what makes it really significant and really important. So. Le Morte d'Artur is significant largely because it is the first book to bring together all the various legends and stories about King Arthur and his knights. And it brings them all together and puts them into one book. So prior to Le Morte d'Artur, there had been many stories written about King Arthur and about his knights and all that kind of story world, but they'd all been written in little pieces. So they were all more kind of short story type things um, 
and they focused on different aspects of the story, but nobody had put everything together into one kind of comprehensive volume that covered the whole story. And so Le Mort d'Artour is the first book to really do that. You had stories about various knights on their individual quests, and Arthur was kind of a background figure. You also had some chronicles of Arthur's life that were very short, and you had some kind of elaborations of certain parts of Arthur's life, but they were all bits and pieces here and there. And so Sir Thomas Mallory actually kind of undertakes a monumental task when writing Le Mort d'Artour, because he undertakes to take all of these different stories and pull them together in a way that makes sense. And so that's quite a feat. He drew on both French and English sources to write the book. So there were a lot of stories about Arthur, both in French and in English. The Arthur stories, although they originated in England, had become very popular in France as well. Um, so this does tell us that Sir Thomas Mallory was probably fluent in both French and English. But he drew on both of these different types of sources and took a whole bunch of stories and worked them together. However, part of the tradition of Arthur stories was that every author was always kind of adding something new or making his own changes and taking his own twist on the story. And so Sir Thomas Mallory continues that tradition and he adds his own original storyline at one point in the book, the tale of Sir Gareth. Uh, so he adds the character of the knight Sir Gareth to the Arthurian legend and then creates a story about him. So he continues that kind of ongoing tradition of adding and modifying things. And the Arthur stories have always been very flexible. Um, there's never been kind of one standard version of the Arthur story. And even today, as people continue to rewrite and reinvent the Arthur story, it's been very flexible. And I think that's one of the really cool things. Every author is able to take his or her own spin on the story um, and really kind of make it their own while still tying into this much, much older tradition. So Le Mort d'Artour, if there is a standard version of the Arthur story, it is Le Mort d'Artour. Um, it isn't really the only standard, and it's not the only version, it's not even the earliest version, but most people look back to Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Artour as kind of the gold standard of Arthurian legend. And so it's certainly the most standard version, and there is a good reason for that. Um, it has been said that this book has it all, right? Um, it is a book that kind of has something for every reader at some point in the story. And so hopefully, I think you will find that there are stories in this book that you really, really like. You may not like every aspect of the book, but I hope you find certain stories in the book that you enjoy, uh, because it really does have a lot of different things. Swordplay and epic battles are certainly a part of the story. Um, there's quite a bit of romance as well, so if that piques your interest, um, there's kind of magic and intrigue and sorcery because uh, you've got characters like Merlin and Morgan Le Fay and they bring that element to the story. Um, you've got revenge plots, people who are spending years plotting their revenge on other characters. Sir Thomas Mallory also raises some interesting philosophical questions in his work. Um, some questions about the world and the way that it works and society and so forth. There's also some attempt to grapple with spiritual truth. Um, the quest for the Holy Grail is a very spiritual quest, and so there are questions raised about Christianity and the nature of sin and purity and holiness and all that sort of thing that is brought up in Le Mort d'Artour as well. So hopefully you can see there's really quite a bit going on in this work, um, which I think has been part of its appeal over the years. There's a lot going on and there's a lot to draw readers to it, and the story is very, very rich and full of many different things. Mallory, I think one of the other reasons that he appeals to readers and that Le Mort d'Artour appeals to readers over the years is that he addresses a lot of timeless and universal themes while still addressing his own society at the same time. So he addressed some contemporary concerns during his day. We talked about how the War of the Roses was going on, and he was probably imprisoned during the War of the Roses. And so civil war and infighting is something that was very real to him. Um, and he includes quite a bit of that in Le Mort d'Artour, um, especially towards the end of the story. And uh, he may have been offering 
uh, some quite direct commentary on how civil war and infighting can really lead to the destruction of a kingdom uh, and a nation and a country. And so he really seems to be making some poignant commentary there. Beyond that, though, he also addresses themes and concerns that are just as important for us today as they were for Mallory back then. Uh, some of these are questions like, what are the consequences of sin? Like when you make bad decisions, bad choices, um, when you do wrong things, it has consequences. And what does that look like? And he really grapples with that quite clearly in the Mort Dare tour. The question of what does it mean to be a good person? In his frame of reference, he's asking that in terms of what does it mean to be a good knight? Um, but the question is a broader one uh, about what it means to be a good person because a good knight is an example of a good person. Uh, he also addresses why are rules and order important? And that's certainly a very important question, one that we're grappling with in different ways right now because of uh, social distancing and quarantine and so forth because of COVID-19. And we're being asked to follow rules and order that are not a normal part of our lives. And so this question of why are these important has been raised in new ways. Um, and it was a very important question in the medieval era, which was a lot of times quite chaotic. Um, and so he brings that to the table and kind of raises those questions. He also just addresses things like worldly versus spiritual pursuits and sets up a contrast um, and, and shows kind of the difference and the different paths that those lead us to. He talks about loyalty versus betrayal, um, and that's something that we can still identify with. Loyalty and betrayal are still ideas that are very real to us today. So he addresses a lot of things that were important to his time, but are also still important to our time. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about Arthurian romance, um, and this gets at kind of two kind of different genres in the medieval era that kind of merged together in the Arthur stories and in Le Morte d'Arthur. And so we're going to talk about those and what they each look like, what are some of the characteristics of them, and how do they kind of find this mesh in the King Arthur stories. So the first genre, and this was an incredibly popular genre during the medieval era, and I think I talked a little bit about this in my lecture yesterday on the history of uh, the medieval period and the literature of the medieval period, but the medieval romance. Um, the medieval romance is a particular type of literature, and it's not what you would think. When we say romance, in the medieval era, that term did not have the same meaning that it has today. Now, our, our term romance today does come eventually down through many different generations from this first use of the term, uh, but it meant something very different back then. The medieval romance was popularized by a group of poets called troubadours. They were French poets, and they first began to write these stories that were about gallant knights and their chivalric deeds. Um, and so the stories, the medieval romance, really is just stories about knights and their deeds of chivalry. Um, and the troubadours were these singing, traveling poets who traveled around France and would often work for a few nights at the court of a wealthy noble or a king. Um, and they would tell the stories that they had to tell. And they all maybe had different stories. Sometimes they knew the same stories, but sometimes they had their own original stories. And they began to compose these medieval romances, these stories about knights, because knights were such an important part of medieval society. They were such important figures. Um, and they kind of took on this uh, very idealistic view in these stories of the medieval romances. Now, they're called romances because originally these medieval romance stories about knights were composed, they were written and performed in Roman influence languages, as distinguished from the actual Roman language of Latin. So a number of languages in Southern Europe, including French, Italian, um, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, English a little bit as well, were influenced by Latin. Their Latin has a significant influence on all of those languages, but they were not Latin. They were what we call the vernacular languages, and I talked about those in the lecture yesterday. 
Um, and so these medieval romances were originally composed and performed in the vernacular languages, Roman influenced languages. And therefore, from the Roman influence, they got the term romance. Um, and so they became known as romances. Now that eventually leads to our modern definition uh, because later on in the history of literature and philosophy, there's an era known as the Romantic Era. Um, and the Romantic Era of literature did a lot of looking back to the medieval era. They kind of idealized the medieval era and they wrote a lot about medieval stuff and they built medieval looking buildings and all that sort of thing. Um, and so they really idealized that. But one of the uh, characteristics of the Romantic Era was an emphasis on emotion. Um, and so you can see that that emphasis on emotion leads to our emphasis on romantic emotions and feelings, and hence we get romantic uh, referring to something that has to do with uh, love and attraction and so forth. So the term romance does eventually kind of come down from the medieval era to mean what it means today, but back then it simply meant a story told in a vernacular language. However, um, because they were about knights and their deeds of chivalry, knights were often helping damsels in distress. So romance as we know it, love, was often an important part of the plot, uh, though it was not necessarily the main focus. So let's take a time out for a minute, because I said that the medieval romances are tales of knights and their chivalric deeds. So in order to do that, we need to think about what is a knight and what is chivalry. So knights, as you probably know, are uh, soldiers of a certain type in the medieval era. You're probably familiar, you probably have a vague idea of what they are. Um, but here's kind of the basic history of how knights came to be and what was distinct about a knight. So Charles Martel, who you may remember was sometimes called the Hammer and kept the Moors from invading France, uh, when he was fighting uh, the Moors and the Arabs uh, in, uh, in those battles to try to keep them from invading France, he noticed how effective the Arab cavalry was. Um, they had mounted troops, men who rode on, fought on horseback. And he realized that they didn't really have that um, in Europe. And he thought this would probably be a good idea to have. So he decided to form his own mounted troops. Now he was a king, right? And so he granted land to his followers in order to support horsemen. So basically he already had kind of in the medieval feudal system structure, he already had the noble class, people who owned land and they kind of ruled over portions of land, but he decided to give them more land in order for these nobles to be able to support horsemen as mounted troops. In turn, those nobles uh, parceled out their land in smaller portions to knights. And basically said, hey, if you will train to be a knight, to fight on horseback, to put in all this work and pledge to support me militarily, I'll give you a nice home and a nice plot of land that you can call your own. And so, as we talked about the feudal system yesterday, you probably remember that land was one of the major uh, methods of exchange, right, during that time period, as well as military protection. And so the knights then become this kind of central piece of the feudal system as they're granted lands and they protect both the people under them and the people above them. Um, and so knights are essentially mounted fighting men. Um, but it's a very elite position because it took a lot of training. You had to be very physically strong to wear your armor and ride a horse and fight all at the same time. So there's a great deal of physical prowess. Um, you had to be an experienced horseman, obviously, and you had to be well trained in the use of a number of different types of weapons. A lot of foot soldiers only fought with one type of weapon. You would have your bowmen who shot with bows and arrows, and then you would have your swordsmen, and you would have your spearmen. They were trained in one particular thing. But the knights had to actually be trained in a wide variety because of just the necessity of how they fought. So they had to know swords, oftentimes crossbows, um, spears, and lances. So it was a very elite position because it required a lot of work to get at that point. And you had to begin training many times from the time you were a small boy if you wanted to have any chance of being a knight. Um, 
And so there's a reason they kind of kind of elevated those people up. But they became a very important part of society and really kind of the backbone of medieval society in many ways. They didn't necessarily do most of the work. A lot of people under them, the serfs and the peasants, did most of the work. But it was the knights that protected the serfs and the peasants as well as the nobles and the kings. All right, so we also need to talk about chivalry, right? What is chivalry? Um, because if medieval romances are tales of knights and chivalry, we need to know what this chivalry theme is about. So chivalry was essentially a code of moral conduct by which knights were supposed to live. Now scholars have debated how well knights actually abided by the code of chivalry uh, in the medieval era, and there's been a lot of questions about that. The fact is that yes, probably many people fell short, but it was still a good thing to have for them to strive toward um, because you need a moral standard to strive toward. And so knights were supposed to have this standard um, that they were supposed to live by and exercise throughout their lives. So several key characteristics. One of the first things, because almost all of medieval Europe was Christian. Uh, the first idea was that everything you did, your primary allegiance was to God and you offered your services to God first and foremost. But then you also had absolute loyalty to your Lord. So whoever your kind of human Lord was, you were completely devoted to them. So you were devoted to God first and then your Lord second. There was also this idea of defending and not persecuting the weak. Now, it may not have looked quite like we would like it to look today um, because um, kind of the Muslims and uh, the non-believers were kind of outside of this rule, right? You could kind of treat them however you liked, which is why there were some really nasty things that happened in the Crusades. Um, but uh, defending and persecuting the weak meant that you weren't going to take undue advantage of the serfs and the peasants. You weren't going to let people just bully them. Uh, people who couldn't stand up for themselves, you were going to stand up for them and you were not going to persecute them. And that was a really important in medieval society because it would have been very easy for people in power to take advantage of the common people who really didn't have any power at all during the medieval era. Um, and so that was a very important part of the medieval code of chivalry and is a very biblical idea, even if it wasn't exercised to its fullest extent in the medieval era. Defending and honoring women. This was actually a pretty radical thing during the medieval era. Uh, you know, the idea that women deserved any sense of honor or respect. A lot of earlier societies had kind of just treated women as property. And that begins to change in the medieval era. Again, it's not where we would like it to see, where we like to see it today. Um, women were by no means considered equals, but there was this shift that was beginning to take place and women were beginning to have this kind of special place in society and especially for the knight. A knight was supposed to pledge his service to a particular lady in addition to God and his Lord. Um, and so there was this sense that women deserved protecting. They needed to be honored. They uh, needed to be respected. Um, and so this idea that women were not just property, but that they were indeed valuable at some level was a very new idea in the medieval era and has certainly continued on in the trajectory and helped us to find where we are today. Again, it wasn't where we would like it to be in the medieval era, but it was a step in the right direction. Honoring and protecting one's comrades. So you should honor and protect your fellow knights, uh, especially the fellow knights that were fighting alongside you. But I already mentioned even your opposing knights you were supposed to treat with honor and respect. And so when you imprisoned them, you didn't throw them in a nasty dungeon, right? You gave them, you locked them up in a room in a palace and gave them food and access to resources and a nice bed and so forth. Um, you were just supposed to seek honor in a good name, right? A knight was supposed to seek to be a good, honorable person. You were supposed to be polite and courteous in all your conduct. Um, you were just supposed to be a model of being a gentleman, essentially. You were also supposed to fight in a fair and honest manner. Um, so this got at how you were supposed to honor your fellow knights, right? You shouldn't uh, stab someone while they're down. 
Um, you shouldn't stab someone in the back in the middle of a fight. Um, also, if you had the opportunity to avoid killing them, it was better, it was considered better, to take them captive than ra rather than kill them. Um, and so that was just, uh, just really considered an important thing, fighting in a fair and honest manner. And it's actually contributed to kind of the way that uh, people of European descent have conducted warfare down through the years. We've always kind of had this sense that there are rules to war that you do not violate. Like you try to avoid um, killing, hurting, harming uh, citizens, uh, civilians, people who are not involved in the war, women and children, you're supposed to protect them um, and not get them involved in the war. Those have been kind of European rules of warfare for a long time. That's not true for all cultures, and we've uh, faced that challenge in recent years, especially with a lot of fighting in the Middle East and terrorists who don't have those same uh, kind of rules of warfare, the same idea of fighting in a fair and honest manner and are perfectly happy to blow up buildings with civilians inside and so forth. Um, and so that's been part of the struggle that we faced in uh, kind of fighting terrorism in recent years is that there's not kind of that same sense of values. Um, but that idea of not killing civilians and so forth goes all the way back to the medieval era and the code of chivalry. So the medieval romance, tales of gallant knights and chivalry. Let's get into some more specific characteristics. We've talked about the general, let's get more specific. So the main characters of medieval romances are usually kings and queens, knights, and damsels in distress. They're very common characters, and you're going to see a lot of those characters keep cropping up in the Morte Artur. Um, it's also characterized by glamorous portrayals of castle life, focuses on the feasting and the, the celebrations and so forth that take place in the palace. The nitty-gritty details of about medieval life that we often find gross, like um, the fact that you just had a chamber pot and you dumped it out your window every morning into the moat or onto the street, um, that uh, you kept your clothes in the same room as your chamber pot so the smell would scare the moths away, um, that uh, people were often dying of the Black Plague. Those sorts of details don't really make it into medieval romances. Medieval romances idealize the medieval era and they idealize castle life. Um, there, it's not really a realistic depiction, but it is the kind of depiction that we like, right? It's the fantasy depiction, um, and uh, it's the depiction that our medieval stories and TV shows and movies and so forth often portray. Um, the earliest medieval romances were done in verse. And when it comes to the Arthur story, these were often stories about an individual knight who would leave King Arthur's court and go on a quest um, uh, for some particular object. And they were often done in poetry. That's what I mean by in verse. However, later romances were written in prose. And this is true of Le Morte d'Artur. Le Morte d'Artur is a prose piece of literature because prose, non-poetry, was actually rising in popularity towards the end of the medieval period. And so... Um, began to write in the form that we are more familiar with today. We tend to read prose more than we read, read poetry now. Some other characteristics of medieval romances. Um, the medieval romance was supposed to embody the ideals of chivalry, supposed to be a kind of an example of what chivalry should look like, and then sometimes what it should not look like, condemning bad examples of chivalry. I think you'll see a lot of that in the Mort de Artur. Um, romances are often set in a remote time or place. So even though the story of King Arthur is kind of set during a medieval era, um, it's not meant to be contemporary. It's kind of a once upon a time sort of idea, even in the medieval era. Medieval people reading it wouldn't have thought, oh, this just happened a few years ago. It was kind of a long time ago sort of idea, even in the medieval era. And places, um, sometimes specific places were named. A specific country might be named, like England. Arthur is the king of all England. But a lot of the other places that exist in uh, the Arthur stories are kind of made up places. There are a few that are real, but most of the key places are kind of made up places. It's a remote place. It's a place that we don't really know where it is, a kind of glorious nowhere. Um, and so Camelot, uh, no scholars have identified a definitive site in the real world for Camelot. There probably wasn't even 
really a real one. There have been suggestions, um, but nobody's really nobody knows that there was an actual Camelot for sure. The island of Avalon is another one. There have been suggestions about where that might be, but there's no real for sure uh, island of Avalon that we know of. Uh, the romance often emphasizes rank and social distinctions, and so the classes of society like kings and knights and um, peasants and all of that are very clearly delineated between, um, and the story kind of honors the upper class people a little bit more. Certainly not all people are created equal. That's not something that comes until much later in history, and so there's certainly this idealization of the upper classes in medieval romances. Medieval romances often contain a sense of the supernatural, um, magic or divine beings or uh, dragons or something like that, right? Uh, they have these kind of supernatural elements to them. They usually present a hero engaged in some sort of adventure, and you're going to see lots of different heroes engaged in lots of different adventures in Le Morte Artur. Most of the time, this is a pure adventure, right? a holy adventure, an adventure that takes place with good motivations that is supposed to honor and support the ideals of chivalry, but that's not always the case. They often include love as a major plot element. Love is a very significant plot element in Le Morte d'Artour as a whole. Not of every individual story in Le Morte d'Artour, but as a whole work, love is a very major plot piece. Um, but it wasn't always a part of every medieval romance. They also often sometimes feature spontaneous, unmotivated fighting. Like somebody will just ride in and be like, hmm, I challenge you. Can you prove that you are really a good knight? Let's fight. Um, and that's kind of the way it goes. Um, and to us, that seems very kind of uh, nonsensical. But uh, battle was the way that you proved your honor in the medieval era. And so to the medieval audience, it probably made a little bit more sense. So let's turn our attention to Arthurian legend in particular now. It's important to note that medieval romance is a broader category. Not all, um, not all medieval romances were Arthurian stories, um, but many and probably I would say most of the medieval romances were about Arthur or about his knights. Um, so they're kind of about one or the other. Um, but Arthurian legend in particular comes from Breton mythology. The Bretons were a group of Celts who originally lived in England. Um, and so the stories of Arthur date back to Celtic times, which is the very kind of earliest people group that we know occupied England. Now later there was a group uh, that came over from Scandinavia and invaded England. Um, the Angles and the Saxons, and they drove the Celts out. And so the Celts fled in several different directions. They fled west to Wales, north to Ireland and Scotland, and then some of them, the Bretons included, traveled across the English Channel and into France when uh, England was invaded. And so the Bretons settled in northern France in an area we know today as Brittany, which comes from Bretons. Um, Side note, the name Great Britain, which is for the British Isles, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Cornwall, um, that name also comes from the Bretons and the Brythons, who were uh, Celtic groups. So the Bretons have contributed their name to quite a bit. Um, so the Bretons had these tales of King Arthur from the time that they lived in England, and when they migrated into France, um, the French people began to pick up on and become interested in these stories, and they became very, very popular. And so actually the earliest written versions of Arthur legends, because the Bretons just told them by word of mouth, it was an oral tradition, the earliest written versions of the Arthur legends are in French, but then their popularity when um, William the Conqueror, who was French, invaded England, uh, their popularity kind of skyrocketed in England uh, later uh, because the French now had a presence in England. And so the Arthur stories kind of came home and then there began to be a bunch of Arthur stories written in English as well. The Arthur stories often explore the conflict between love and chivalric duty. Um, and so that's kind of a major tension there. Um, they portray knights on a variety of quests. That's a very popular motif in the Arthur stories. The search for the Holy Grail was the most popular 
of the quest stories. Um, that was kind of the one, because it had a spiritual significance, that kind of became the most popular quest story in the Arthurian canon. Now, the Arthur legends probably originated around some historical figure. Um, his name may or may not have been Arthur, and there are some different theories about who this Arthur might have been. Some people think it might have been a Roman general back from when the Romans occupied uh, Great Britain uh, under the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire actually stretched all the way north to England, um, and so some people think it might have been a great Roman general. Other people think it might have been a Celtic chieftain who fought against the Angles and the Saxons uh, when the Angles and the Saxons were invading England, or maybe even fought against the Romans. So we don't really know for sure. We don't even know if his name is Arthur, but most scholars think there was probably some person who won several great battles that kind of inspired these stories. In the long run, that's not really that important because the important thing is the stories as they come down to us. And the stories are almost assuredly nothing like what really happened if there was a historical Arthur. Um, but the stories are the important thing because the stories are what's really had an impact on society and literature and culture. There are several very early sources that refer to Arthur, and these are written in English. They're not really stories, they're more kind of works of history, and Arthur's name is mentioned in a few of them. So On the Ruin and Conquest of Britain by Gildas, which was written probably around AD 540, mentions Arthur. So you can see that this is very, very early on, not long after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and then the Annals of Wales, written in AD 830, also makes a reference to Arthur. These are very kind of passing references. They don't spend a lot of time. They're not really telling a story, but they're kind of like, oh, and by the way, Ar Arthur won these battles, and he was very influential. Um, both of these sources probably place uh, the life of the historical Arthur somewhere between 490 and 516 AD. So again, very shortly after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and so probably uh, a, a very, very early figure, not a medieval king, although the stories have him as a medieval king, but the real Arthur probably wasn't. So time out. I've been using this term Arthurian legend. So Quick review, what is a legend? We talked a little bit about this when we talked about Mulan and the legend of Mulan, but let's quickly review what that is. So legends are usually originally anonymous. That is true here. They were stories told by the Bretons by word of mouth. Nobody knows who first started telling them because probably they were originally stories that were told about something that really happened, right? And there wasn't an author making something up, although they change very drastically over time. They're usually based very, very loosely on history. So we've talked about how there might have been a historical Arthur, but that the story has changed a lot and really is unrecognizable to what may have really happened. Uh, they reflect the attitudes and values of society. And since the Arthur legends are told in the form of medieval romance, then this is certainly the case because they really talk about chivalry. And that's the value of the society that produces these stories is the chivalric code. They oftentimes contain characters with supernatural power. So Merlin, Morgan Le Fay, um, these wizards and witches and so forth definitely fulfill that part of the idea of a legend. They usually relate fantastic events. So the supernatural events are fantastic, but also just kind of the feats that Arthur and his knights are able to pull off are oftentimes very like, whoa, people in the real world could not actually do that. So often there's kind of this fan fantastic from which we get fantasy element as well. So King Arthur stories, um, we have kind of these King Arthur stories that are told in the form of medieval romance, and they kind of merge very nicely in Le Morte de Arthur. Um, and that Le Morte de Arthur is actually the last work of Arthurian legend in the medieval era. However, uh, 
the Arthurian legend has continued on down through the years and continues to be incredibly popular in popular culture today. And in fact, many people continue to write stories about Arthur, um, to make movies about Arthur and TV shows about Arthur. Um, it is one of the stories that gets retold again and again and again. And it's one of those stories that's just captured the imagination of our culture and that we really, really uh, have come to love and enjoy. And so a few examples of how that has continued, um, the uh, movie The Sword in the Stone, a Disney movie, Disney, you know, you know you've kind of made it as a story when Disney adapts you into a movie. Um, uh, there is the TV show starting in 2008, I think it, it ran for five seasons, uh, Merlin, which kind of reimagines the Arthur story and it reimagines Merlin as a teenager um, who is kind of growing up alongside Arthur. Very good show. I watched it all and I would recommend it if you haven't watched it. Um, even our board games, uh, Days of Wonder, which makes a number of popular games like Ticket to Ride, Small World, and so forth, has a... Uh, Arthur-themed board game, Shadows Over Camelot, um, very fun game as well. Um, uh, authors have continued to adapt the Arthur story in book form, many, many different versions of that. I may later put up a If You Like Arthur thing that recommends some books and TV shows. One of my favorites is The Pendragon Cycle uh, by Stephen R. Lawhead, which actually tries to reimagine the Arthur story more historically. Uh, during the time period when the real Arthur might have actually lived, but still draws on all the traditional elements of the Arthur story. So this is a very important narrative in our culture. It continues to be a very popular story to tell. Um, and so I think it's really cool that we're going to get to read kind of what is considered the most definitive work on Arthur. It's not the standard work because there's no one standard work. There have been many works, a lot of little pieces that came before Le Morte d'Arthur, and then Sir Thomas Mallory took all those pieces and put them together. But many people have also written different versions after Le Morte d'Arthur. But this is kind of uh, the... Uh, the one that everybody goes back to. And so I think it'll be great that we get to read this. So um, tomorrow I'm going to be giving you some instructions on uh, how to start to read Le Mort d'Arthur. I will give you a little heads up. I'm going to provide a written PDF version, but um, because it was written in the medieval era, medieval English was pretty significantly different um, back then. Um, and some spellings were very, very strange, and so it could be difficult to read in the original Middle English. And some of the translations that are available online are a little bit older, and they're a little bit clunkier to read. So um, the, the version that I had that we were going to read if you had been on campus is a newer translation and tries to translate it a little bit more into modern English. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a version of that available online. So I'm going to provide you one of the older versions. It's a little bit clunkier. I will tell you what pages to read in that version if you want to read it silently to yourself. However, um, the publisher, uh, Signet Classics, has granted um, schools and teachers and libraries permission to do reading of the book out loud for their students. So I'm actually going to be working on creating an audiobook of this particular version of the Arthur story. So I will be reading it out loud. So if you would like to read the book in that way, I will post um, chapters at a time um, and I will try to when I assign something, I will try to have all the chapters available for you so you can go ahead and listen to them. So you will be able to access it in that way as well. So um, feel free to either listen to the book or read it on your own, um, whichever one works best for you and whichever one you would like to do. Um, and uh, I will be assigning certain assignments and so forth as we begin reading through Le Morte d'Arthur. Um, so I hope you guys are excited about this book and ready to enjoy it and the story, and you will be kind of Arthurian experts when we get all done. All right, guys, have a great day, and let me know if you have any questions.